gracious Heavenly Father. Once again, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for you allowing us to continue to study together as we've done. I thank you, dear Lord, for all of your, your tender mercies and grace that you, the Holy Spirit would, I ask that he would illuminate the truth of his word, filtering out all of that which is, was not, which is not true, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Hi, this is Steve uh, again at blessedhopeforever.com. And we're continuing on in our study in the book of Revelation, uh, somewhat verse by verse, uh, section by section, perhaps you could say chapter by chapter. So I'd like to begin by getting you to think about something. When I look at chapter 5, I look at the overall context as, as being one in which what, what we are seeing is the exaltation of Christ. Uh, all creatures exalting Christ. Uh, when it comes to the four living creatures, I, I want to I just quickly point something out. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, uh, at the very beginning of Scripture, we see light, uh, the creation of light, the, the earth or land, the, the seas or in the atmosphere, the heavens, the fish, birds, land, creatures, and man, which is given dominion. And then God rested, and, and all was good. And He blessed everything to be fruitful and multiply. And then we see the living creatures, lion, calf, man, and eagle in, in our study in Revelation. I think there's a connection there. In Roman, Romans 8, we know that the earnest expectation of the creature uh, eagerly awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, if we go back and we and we look at that, uh, which we did uh, when we did our study through the uh, the epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, it said that the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, of God. And I believe that's all of creation because it says that we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And, uh, and not only they, uh, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting and that's, a, that's an eager anticipation of the adoption, the redemption of our body, our physical body. Okay? And so when we come over to Revelation and we see the four living creatures, uh, God's covenant that He made with, with all of creation, that's what we're looking at here. And I, want you to, I don't want you to miss the picture of that. At least that's how I'm, I'm looking at that. Now, in the fourth chapter, uh, we saw John was commanded to come up to heaven. And I've, I've told you that I personally think that that's a good type of the rapture of the church. You may, not, you may or may not agree with that. That's okay. Uh, but the first thing that he saw in heaven was a throne and one sitting on that throne and the word there is an imperfect tense in the Greek. So this throne, what that's saying is that this throne is being set up. Apparently it's not a throne that's always been there. This is a new throne set up because we're preparing for God's judgments. And the next thing that uh, John sees around that throne are 24 other thrones in which are seated uh, 24 elders, elder, elderly men, says, says the Greek, is, that's the Greek word. And they had white raiment, they wore white raiment, and they had crowns on their head. And I believe that they represent, again, the raptured church. And uh, I think that as we go along, the more that we progress through this, we see it's the church. 
And he saw four living creatures, or living things. The word is neuter. I pointed that out, uh, which is different than the, the believers or the elders. And they had likenesses of a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle, uh, which is backwards from what was given to us in Ezekiel. And I believe that they represent God's government, uh, His covenant, with His creation. And they are constantly praising the Lord. Saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. I believe that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, holy three times. And they recognize the sovereignty of God. And as they give glory to God, these, these 24 elders also fall down and give all glory to the one that's sitting on the throne. And now in chapter 5, in chapter 5, we see that, that John sees something else. He saw a little book, uh, a little scroll, the word biblion in the Greek, uh, in the right hand of the one who's sitting on the throne, which I believe is God the Father. And it was sealed with seven seals and a, and a, a strong angel, a mighty angel, then begins to proclaim that no man or no one However you want to translate that, no man in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open that scroll, was able to open that book. And John wept. He wept greatly, in fact. And that makes me think of some of the scriptures, you know, like, uh, be not angry with us forever. Uh, and, and in Isaiah 64, how long shall the wicked triumph uh, we have in Zechariah, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? Uh, even in the sixth chapter, uh, the, the following chapter in here in our study, we'll read, and they, cry, they cried out with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true? How long, O Lord? And it's one of the elders, one of the elders who says to John, Don't weep. I want you to imagine why you and I, if, if, if that were us there, why the, we would weep. You know, I, I previously stated how I thought John should have known that no man, you know, was able to open the scroll. You know, that uh, at least that's what we would think, you know, that he knew that Christ was the only one worthy. Uh, surely he, did, he must have. And perhaps that's true, but... I think what the Holy Spirit wants us to see here in this uh, very important context here is that, that whatever was in that scroll, no man could fully realize it until the church was in heaven. Which says to me that there is a, that there is a longing. You can't say that there's not a longing on the part of the church to witness the fulfillment of God's judgment of the wicked. I, I would even go as far as to say all of creation and His salvation of His people, the redemption of our bodies. And that the, this could not occur until after the church, the harpazo, after the church was removed and taken to heaven. John could not look. He could not look upon the scroll. But, it, but note that the scroll had been written at this point. At this point, it, it had been written. But it had not yet been written from a physical standpoint because, well, John was the one who would come to write what he saw. Okay? Uh, you know, that the book or the scroll is, I suggest it is the book of Revelation. You may not agree with that. That's okay, too. And, and it's, it's, it's one of the elders who says, don't weep. Stop weeping. It's a, it's a present imperative. I want you to look. Okay? Don't weep, but look. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. And we, we as God's people, we've trusted God for nearly 2,000 years. And it seems like that we're not winning. You know, especially if you look around today. But we are. God says that we are 
perfected. We've been perfected forever. He says all of our sins are forgiven, and yet you sin every day. You and I sin every day. He says you've crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts, and, and well, you know that that just can't be true, but, but it is. It is. You know, I've had people actually come and up to me screaming at me, you know, saying, you know, Steve, we ought to crucify the flesh. We need to crucify self. We need to put self to death. It doesn't say that. It says that they that are His have, have crucified the flesh. Why? Because Christ died in our place and we were crucified with Him. Somebody sent me an email some, some time ago. Uh, you know, well, Steve, how could you say that it doesn't matter how you live? how that we live, you know, and that you're still going to heaven. You can live however you want, and you're still going to heaven. Well, I'm not going to heaven because of the way I live. I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ died in my place, period, okay? And this member of the church, this elder, says, stop weeping. You know, as we ourselves would if we feared that this would not all be brought to a conclusion. Stop weeping. The great God Almighty has prevailed. He's overcome. Same word for our overcoming to open this little book and to loose the seven seals. The day is going to come, folks, when the Lord is going to execute justice and usher in a new era of, of righteousness and peace. That is what we as Christians long for. It is what John would have longed for. We look back at the life of Paul, we see that he longed for the salvation of, of, of God's people Israel. And God could not, He could not execute His judgments on this creation until Jesus Christ died in the place of His own. Until He overcame. Until that prevailing, verse 5, the written judgments of God couldn't be revealed and they could not uh, be carried out. They could not fall. You know, Daniel looked at them and God said, seal them up until the time of the end. It's not the time. But Christ has now overcome. He's prevailed. The text tells us, I looked and there stood a lamb a lamb, and and the Holy Spirit wants us to see Christ as the, it's articulated, Lamb of God. Did He really look like an actual lamb? A lamb that had hands to take the book from the one sitting on the throne. I mean, I don't, I don't picture some monster here, half man, half lamb. I doubt He was half man and half lamb. I mean, John the Baptist cried, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay? And they looked and saw, they saw, I believe, they saw the God-man Jesus Christ. That's, that's what I, I believe. And He appeared to have been slain. The scars are there. The mark in His side, the, the nail prints in His hand, the, you know, perhaps the scars on His head. But He's alive. He's alive. And we could spend months, months, talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not dead. He's alive. And by His one offering, He has perfected forever those whom He has sanctified. How, how perfect is perfect? And how long is forever? Well, Steve, you don't mean that you can live any way you want. Still, gonna... Well, what does it mean to be perfected? I mean, was I, was I perfected by the way I live? You know, if I'm, not, if I'm not perfected by the way I live, how can I be unperfected by the way I live? Dearly beloved, you're redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. Don't miss this stuff, this doctrinal stuff here. I know that you, many of you come here to see you know, comets and dragons and asteroids and earthquakes. And uh, Listen, 
you're not you're not redeemed okay by anything that you you've done you have no scripture for that you're redeemed because jesus christ died in your place and he's alive he looks like he had died but he's alive our our lord jesus christ is alive I believe the, the foundation of our trust and belief is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If He, if he has not been raised, then we, of all men, are, are most to be pitied. You know, so we're just wasting our time here. You know, uh, why do you folks, why do you come to this channel and listen to me? Why do you come here to study His Word if He didn't rise from the dead? If he didn't raise from the dead, we have no hope. There is no blessed hope. But he did rise. He's alive. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are, the text says, are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, not just the United States, you know, all the earth. Isaiah chapter 11. I believe that's a clear reference to the Holy Spirit. And they're sent forth into all the earth. You know, part of our weeping, folks, ought to go out in deep concern for the masses of people who have no hope and, and who are in intense suffering. But we, but we can leave that in the Lord's hands. The, the text says they're sent forth into all the earth. You know, why should there be so many people suffering, so many people starving? Why should there be so much war and terrorism and, and upheaval and riot, riots and, and, and difficulty and persecution and death? People, people actually, actually slaughtered for virtually no reason because of sin. We need to realize how awful and how terrible sin is. It, it required the greatest price of all eternity, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place. And I think it, if, if I could put, if I can put it, uh, emotion in, in, in theology, the most emotional verse of the Bible, if not one of the most emo emotional verses, is the fifth verse of the fifth chapter of, of the book of Revelation. All of God's plan from eternity past, all of his work in creation and in mankind is balanced on the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And he died in your place. And because he died and he rose again, you will also shall live. We're looking here at at God's prophetic plan for His creation, which could not be executed until, until Christ had died and risen again and until the church is gone. That's why it's sealed. And now we've almost, I believe, completed, at least I hope we have, the church period, the age of grace. And, and this period was a period that had not been revealed to generations and ages past. What we've been living through, what, the, what we've been living through the past nearly 2,000 years is never mentioned in the Old Testament, never mentioned in the Gospels. You know, it, it, was, it was not revealed until He revealed it to His apostles and to His prophets. So in the sixth verse, the sixth verse, we find that the Lamb is worthy He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And He is the Lamb that had been slain. The Lamb. That is, a, that is a perfect tense in the Greek. It means He's not going to die again. Okay? Folks, whenever you gather together, if, you know, for the, to partake of communion, to partake of you know, of the Lord's Supper. 
You know, there's no blood, there's no, there's no sacrifice. By partaking of those elements, you, you don't gain any additional forgiveness for additional sins, or you don't gain any further uh, purification or, or a renewal of, of acceptance uh, before God. Those require the death of Jesus Christ, which happened once. You know, in the Roman Mass, the Catholic Mass, Christ is crucified thousands of times every day around the world. You come to that table of communion, folks, to praise God for the fact that He died once and only once. And by that sacrifice, you are perfected forever. And to partake of communion, so to, so to partake of communion in an unworthy manner, Well, it's not the popular idea of, you know, to, the, to you partake of it with sin in your life that you hadn't confessed yet. You know, unworthy means thinking by you taking communion that you somehow gain merit or favor with God. That's, that's an unworthy manner. And it's a manner for which you'll be judged. Communion is professing that your only merit is Christ. Your only claim is Christ. The only standing that you have before God is in Christ. It is that which honors the death of Christ, the Lamb which had been slain. It's a perfect tense. He's not going to die again. By one offering, He has perfected forever those whom He has set apart. And I know many of, you, of, of the people watching this, they don't care about that. They just want to know about the earthquakes and the, and, the, and the asteroids and all that stuff. We're not there yet, folks. He did the perfecting forever. You know, just difficult for people to comprehend. You know, what do we do? Nothing. Anything that we do demeans what He's done. We are perfected forever because of Christ. We're eternally redeemed. That's forever redeemed because of Christ. That, folks, is why they are praising and worshiping Him before that throne who is alive forevermore, casting their crowns before the throne, exalting Christ, praising Christ. Okay? Not because they are, you know, well, they're so relieved that they finally succeeded in making it. That, that's what I believe that we need to carry away from this scene in chapter 5. Christ is being exalted. What is it we do in our lives? We exalt Christ. We build on Christ. We're looking at the finished results of that transaction and that work in, in our lives. Even now, we stand perfect before Christ without spot, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, in His sight. Our Lord is the one that came. He's the only one that could come. He's the one that came and took the book out of the right hand, that is the hand of authority and power of Him that sat on the throne, which I believe is, is God the Father. You know, He's one God eternally existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when he took that book, when he took that scroll, it means that we, the church, can no longer be here on earth. Think, folks, chapters 2 and 3, which dealt with the churches to which the letters were addressed, are in a period that does not exist in, in, in prophetic Scripture in the, in the literal sense the, the actual churches, it does in the sense that they apply to the churches today. But that's why in Matthew 24 we see, well, we see clearly. Just read Matthew 24. You won't see the church. What, what you're, you're looking at there is the tribulation period. You know, what a, a crescendo of praise. It's about time, Lord, that you took over. Now, I may be wrong. But it doesn't look to me like it may be 
too long before we may find ourselves a part of this very scene. But my question to you, folks, is, are we worshiping Him, exalting Him, praising Him, even now, like we see that we will be then? I believe that there was a great outpouring of, of praise because believers down through the centuries, you know, and the Old Testament, they longed for the coming of the kingdom. And Christians who are even now, you know, undergoing difficult circumstances, uh, trials, intense suffering, they look forward to the day when there is no more sin, no more trial, no more suffering, no more tears, no more sorrow. And so we have this great crescendo of praise that, that, that's, that we see taking place in chapter 5. And as they fall down before the Lamb, they have a harp and they have golden vials. Precious is the worship of the saints. Your worship to God is not lost. It's in a golden vial. It's, it is that precious to God. Sometimes we, you know, we think we talk to the Lord and He doesn't hear us as though He's not concerned at all you know, about our lives. He's too busy worrying about bigger things. You know, He's not worried about our lives or our condition. I believe we have a passage of Scripture that says that He has them all. And that they are so precious to Him that He has put our prayers, our worship, in golden vials. I know the text says prayers. There are several words for prayer. Well, actually, there's, there's, another, there's quite a number. I think there's 12 words, different words for prayer. This one is prosukamai. It's probably the most common word for prayer that involves essential worship. You know, there's, there's words for uh, prayer, for requests, or for beseeching, and so forth. But the, the, the basic nuance of this word is worship. And it's worship to God when you're in a time of difficulty and you say, Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but, but thy will be done. And they sang a new song. That's a, that's a present tense. They are singing a new song. It's the word new there. It's, it's the word is it's new with respect to quality. And now we're no longer, you know, saying or singing, Oh Lord, how long, how long? Okay, it's, an, it's a new song. This is not the cry of those who were in suffering and difficult. They're singing a new song with respect to quality and content. Not, not with respect to age. And the grammar says it's the 24 elders who are singing. A little bit later on in verse 12, the angels are saying with a loud voice. They, they are not singing with a loud voice. They are saying with a loud voice. Uh, you know, not singing. And it's masculine. So it's the elders singing. And in verse 10, God has made us, the word is us, unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We've got, we've got five major Greek translations that have the word us. We've got none, zero, that have the word men. So I believe that the 24 elders, uh, once again, we see what appears to be another confirmation that the 24 elders represent the raptured church. And what they're singing is you have redeemed us. And that's masculine. You've redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So that to me would look like the church and we shall reign on the earth. So, the church is going to reign, not in heaven, but on earth. 
And the last four verses, 11, verses 11 through 14, describe all creatures exalting the Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, which defines our entire lives as Christians. Dearly beloved, it defines our ministry. It defines, defines, it defines our, our walk, our message, our, our life. It, it, def it, it defines the judgment seat of Christ where that we built on Christ. Not self, not ourselves, but we built on Christ. This, this entire chapter delivers the unmistakable message that what occurs before the wrath of God is poured out, before we, we begin to see these seals opened and the trumpet judgments and bowl judgments, our Lord Jesus Christ is exalted by the church as well as all living creatures. And Christians today who exalt self above Christ, which I, I believe defines the majority of Christianity, they will not find that attitude before God's throne in Revelation chapter 5. Think about that. What we are seeing in this chapter is the exaltation of Christ which ought to be nothing new to us, given the fact that this actually defines our very existence as though, you know, I, I get, it, it's stunning. I find this absolutely, absolutely amazing in the sense that, that and, and I, folks, I'll venture to say that, that most Bible students who go into the book of Revelation studying this, they miss so much doctrinal truth because they, they are so, I guess, infatuated with, with all of the, the idea of, of ju the judgments, you know, the you know, earthquakes and the famines and the pestilence and the asteroids or, or comets or whatever they are, or the polar shift and you know, all this stuff, you know, that causes the, you know, that wreaks all this havoc and stuff. It's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's, they, they want a good movie to watch, okay? But they are so little concerned with doctrine. And folks, we've seen doctrine in this all the way from the beginning when we f first started looking at all seven letters and how that the grace of God overruled all of man's Mistakes. All of his failure. All of the criticism. The, the criticism was not, it wasn't that Christ in the letters had anything against the believer individually, personally. But what he had against these churches, most of them, was the message that they preached which was not exalting Christ, which is what we see in this beautiful chapter of chapter 5. Well, I'm out of time. I just want to thank you all so much. I hope you had a wonderful, blessed Christmas uh, weekend. Uh, I want to thank you for all your continued prayers. Uh, things are uh, still a little uncertain as, as, as far as my test results go. Uh, more tests are to follow. Uh, it's I may have some problems that uh, that that I want to have to have dealt with, but uh, I just I want to say that I I I so appreciate your prayers, and I ask you to continue to pray for the direction of this ministry, for those that come here and listen, that they would the Lord would take and 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 shine Christ in their hearts. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.